This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. He was handsome. And together, they seemed to have the kind of love that could survive any adversity. Pat described her feelings in a note she wrote to Tom on the back of their wedding picture. We are joined together as one for life. What greater thing is there for two human souls than to be joined together for life? To strengthen each other in all our labor, to lean on each other in time of need, to rest on each other in time of sorrow, to minister to each other in time of pain, to be with each other always, with our memories and our oneness, love to sustain us. I feel that in loving my Tom I am nearest to heaven. When I came to you, my Tom, I put me within your hand, my body, heart, and soul. You are my love, and you make me wholly yours in all the ways there are. This sweet bondage is more enduring than locks or bars. I will never leave your breast to dream of other things, for I have found in my Tom the end of my quest. My body blooms all over from every vein because I'm Tom's pat. Behold, I left the old me far behind and shed my old life leaf by leaf. And so she had. Pat and Tom set out to create from their perfect love a perfect world. And yet, within that paradise, lurked the possibility of jealousy and rage of adultery, fornication, incest, rape, and even murder, grim and violent intrusions from the real world. Each of them had family ties far too strong to let loving commitment grow unstunted. Back and back and back, old slights magnified rather than diminished. Pride, like the kudzu covering the dry earth, only scabbed over deep and painful wounds that had never healed. Untangling the story of their lives is akin to following the verdant convolutions of that parasitic vine that eventually kills every living thing that sustains it. Chapter 2 They had come to each other from the cold ashes of failed marriages. At thirty, Tom was younger than Pat by six years. He had two short bad marriages behind him, and she had one long one in which she had felt trapped and smothered. Both of them had sought perfect love most of their lives. Despite the odds, they truly seemed to have found it in each other, although, at least on the surface, they had nothing more in common than potent sexual passion. Tom was strong as an ox and Pat was tiny-boned and fragile, often ill. He was a blacksmith. She loved doing dainty handwork, embroidery, and painting. He had a college education, and she had married first when she was in the tenth grade and dropped out of school. He was calm and soothing, and she sometimes seemed anxious and frightened. It didn't matter. All he had to do was open up his huge arms and she would crawl up on his lap and hide in the safety of his strength. Tom always told Pat, Remember, Shug, first things first, and the first, most important thing is that I love you more than anything in this world. And she would answer in the soft little girl's voice that belied her thirty-six years, I love you, Sugar. I love you, Shug. Pat Taylor had known Tom for years before she really saw him. Her whole family, her parents, retired Army Colonel Clifford Radcliffe and his wife Marguerite, her children Susan, Deborah, and Ronnie, as well as Pat herself, was deeply involved in the horse show world of Atlanta. The Radcliffe stables boasted some of the area's finest horses. Pat, who was living with her parents, taught riding to an exclusive clientele, and both her daughters were champion equestriennes. Tom Allenson had worked with their horses and sold them feed when he was employed by Ralston Purina. The son of an attorney, he had set out to be a veterinarian, although he had not quite reached that goal. 
Tom had been a friend to Pat's family, nothing more, but any woman who watched him at work, naked to the waist, his muscular torso.